And do you realize that anyone who has insurance now, Juan, cannot go into the public option? They have to be people who don't have insurance. And the result is that I think very few people will actually be entitled to enroll. Now, you, Dr. Ali Fine, of course, are an advocate uh, for single payer. What about Kucinich's amendment, which has states voting whether they can uh, uh, offer single well, payer? Well, this will be another amendment that will be offered on the House floor, and frankly, Bernie Sanders is going to introduce it into the Senate as well, uh, which would give states the option to, in fact, institute a, a single payer approach. Uh, what, what's required there is, number one, that states would be able to use both Medicare and Medicaid money and, frankly, uh, have the ERISA exemption. That ERISA is, is a, <laughs> Employee Retirement Income Security, Income Security Act. Act. <laughs> this, this is an exemption that allows multi-state self-insured companies to be uh, out of any kind of state regulation. And they tend to be the most wealthy companies, and if you exclude them, from being in a state single payer, you really don't have a viable plan. So because you're for single payer, what are your thoughts now on public option, the way it's coming out in the House, the way it's coming out in the Senate? Are you saying don't support either? Well, it's hard, you know, um, but I think generally we're very, number one, we don't know what's going to come out, but generally uh, our concern is that people really don't know the consequences of what is being proposed. And I think, again, Elizabeth is right that unless the subsidies are substantial, what we're going to get are health insurance policies, if they're affordable, that are, are Swiss cheese policies, high deductibles before they go into effect, large coinsurances so people will have to pay a lot out of pocket for care. It's, it's, it's a defective product. And that really troubles us, and I think has the potential to trouble the Democratic Party in the long run. And uh, Lois, suddenly you've tried to focus uh, principally on how this, the various proposals might affect uh, the health insurance needs of women who are often discriminated against by the existing insurance system. Can you talk about how those proposals are shaping up? Sure. And in fact, um, we're concerned about women and our families, so it's not just women we care about. But there are some important gains for women in the current legislation. For example, um, in the individual insurance market where you have to go buy your own health insurance if you don't have it from an employer, many states now allow insurance companies to discriminate against women by charging us more. It's called gender rating. And it, it means that insurance is not so affordable for women. Women also have a real problem with that pre-existing condition issue. Uh, if you've had breast cancer, if you have asthma or diabetes, and some particular ones for women are just shocking. There are some states that allow insurers to charge you more if you've been a victim of domestic violence. And so this... How do you charge more? You charge... <laughs> A woman more if you ha if she has a history of being a victim it's of a domestic violence. It's a pre-existing condition. It's a pre-existing condition, right? Pregnancy as well, um, and particularly if you've had a C-section delivery in the past, the insurance companies figure, well, she had a C-section once, so she might have one again, and those are more expensive. We don't want her. So either they deny you the health insurance or they charge you more. And that's just discriminatory. So that would actually be prohibited under this legislation. It's an important gain for women. Another important gain for women is that maternity care would be mandated. You would be shocked at how many insurance plans do not include maternity care. You would think it's a given, but it's not. And lastly for women, um, I want to mention the issue of many, many women, in fact about a quarter of women, have what's called dependent health insurance coverage. This means they get it from a husband or a partner. And if you get divorced, you're in big trouble. You lose your dependent health insurance coverage. Or if your husband dies. Or if maybe your partner's older than you are and becomes eligible for Medicare, all of a sudden, you're left with nothing. So at least this would provide a backstop for those women. They'd be able to go into the insurance marketplace and get a policy. 
I want to ask you about the A word, abortion, um, right. how abortion fits into the current health care debate. This is what President Obama had to say last month in his speech before Congress. And one more misunderstanding I want to clear up. Under our plan, no federal dollars will be used to fund abortions, and federal conscience laws will remain in place. Uh, that was President Obama. Uh, your response, Lois. Well, obviously, um, as a women's health advocate, I was dismayed to hear him say that. Um, but um, what he's reflecting is um, a compromise that's been um, agreed upon on Capitol Hill that the existing policies, the status quo on federal funding of abortion, would be maintained in this legislation. So, women who are on Medicaid, no federal funding would go towards abortion services for those women. There are some states, like New York, where state money is used to, and that would continue under this bill. What it would allow is women who buy private insurance policies through that exchange would be able to buy policies with abortion coverage in them. And here's the key issue that's being debated right now in the House, and it's a huge issue, is what if you are a woman buying an insurance policy, a private policy in the exchange, and you need a public subsidy to afford it? Could you use that public money the answer is no. The funds would have to be segregated. So the public subsidy would go in one pot, your private premium dollars would go in another pot, and only the private premium dollars could pay for the abortion coverage. Some um, anti-choice folks in the House, especially Representative Bart Stupak from Michigan, are trying to make this even worse and Orrin Hatch in the Senate, they want to make abortion coverage into a rider that you would have to buy separately. Now I would ask you, how many women would buy an abortion rider when they're often used for unplanned pregnancies? Unplanned is the whole idea. So we think that would be a terrible step back, and we urge uh, Speaker Pelosi to hold firm against any attempts to further erode abortion rights. Uh, Elizabeth, I'd like to ask you about another hot-button issue, uh, uh, Im immigrants. How are uh, immigrants treated in the various bills, both those who are here legally as well as those who are here uh, uh, illegally or undocumented? Um, immigrants are treated horribly. It's, that's all there is to it. Uh, even in the House bill, which is most, I mean, first of all, un undocumented folks are just off the table. No one will even talk about it. There's nothing to be done to be addressed, addressing undocumented immigrants. And in fact, in order, one of the ways to pay for health reform is to claw back money, this disproportionate share hospital funding money that funds things like the Health and Hospitals Corporation, public hospitals in New York City and others, which basically use that money to pay for providing care for undocumented folks. So that's a, a horror show, to be frank. Um, for lawfully present immigrants, it's also quite bad. After federal welfare reform in the mid-90s, people who already have their green cards, paying taxes, working, um, are not allowed to get uh, publicly funded uh, coverage, federally funded coverage, Medicaid coverage, whatever. And that bar was reversed under the Child Health Plus Restoration Act at the beginning of the year, and it looks like we're not even going to be able to get that same reversal in the House bill, and it's not, again, on the table in the Senate. But so, the bar on legal immigrants will be for five years? Five years. So they, they would not be eligible to get, get subsidized coverage for the first five years they're in the country. It's very punitive, and it's very... Actually, it's, it's not smart, because... Immigrants are working, very healthy people. We want them in the system. They should be encouraged in the system. They'll bring down health insurance premiums for, for everybody. I mean, I don't mean to talk about immigrants as a, as a monolith, but, you know, as, you know as, a role, as a rule, this would be an, in fact, actually a very important, th you know, group to have in, in play. And um, our country is, is doing the wrong thing here. There was an example recently uh, that was brought out in the Huffington Post Investigative Fund. Lois Sutley, I wanted to ask you about Christina Turner, drugged and raped by two men in 2002 after taking anti-HIV drugs prescribed by her doctor as a preventative measure. She was denied health insurance. The HIV drugs Turner was told raised too many questions, health questions, for her insurer. What do you do in these cases? Well